This is problem 5-139, it's on page 265. The air in an insulated, rigid, compressed air tank uh, whose volume is a half cubic meter is initially at 4,000 kilopascals and 20 degrees Celsius. Enough air is now released from the tank to reduce the pressure to 2,000 kilopascals. Following this release, what is the temperature of the remaining air in the tank? Okay, let's make a sketch of this. Uh, a scuba tank is shown in the photo associated with the problem, but I'm going to draw it something like this. A lot of times when we're dealing with unsteady problems, what we'll do is we'll draw a tank connected to a supply line. Now, in this case, the supply line is just the atmosphere, where we know it's going to come out to whatever the local atmospheric pressure happens to be. In any case, um, let's jot down some information about this. Uh, state 1, before the process begins, uh, let's put it down here. State 1 has uh, the information as follows. The initial pressure is 4,000 uh, kilopascals, and the initial temperature is 20 degrees Celsius. We know that the volume of the tank is the same throughout. It's a half cubic meter, so we'll just jot that down. And we know that this process continues until the pressure in the tank drops to 2,000 kilopascals. So for state two, the volume is still the same as it was, but now there's only 2,000 kilopascals pressure in the tank. And what we'd like to find uh, is what's the temperature of the air in the tank. So in state two, what does the temperature end up being? Now let's start off and think through this first of all. Uh, what's going on here? Well, let's see. Air is escaping, okay? Well, why would that change the temperature? Or would it change the temperature at all? If you think about it, the amount of air, or the amount of energy in the air uh, is just a function of the temperature. Remember the experiment that Joule performed that showed this. And so, you know, if I were to just reach in and pull out a bunch of air, wouldn't the air inside still be at the same temperature? So why can't we just say the temperature in state two is 20 degrees Celsius? Well, the reason we can't is because the air that leaves comes out with a different form of energy than it had when it was in here. Now, it's got thermal energy. Both the air in the tank and the air leaving have thermal energy. In other words, their temperature is above absolute zero. But if you stop and think about it, you realize, well, the air that leaves not only has thermal energy, it has flow energy as well. Okay, so it has uh, the fact that it's pushing the atmosphere out of the way. You could look at this as a form of boundary work here. But anyway, uh, since we've got a system that's closed and mass crosses the system boundary, well then that mass that crosses the system boundary carries enthalpy with it. Okay, we can also talk about the kinetic energy, but we're not given any cross-section uh, information here. And so where does that excess energy from, come from? Because the air that leaves must come out at the same temperature of whatever the stuff is in the tank. So where does that extra energy come from? Well, it comes from the air of the tank. So we expect the temperature in state two to be lower than 20 degrees because what remains had to send this other air on its way. Does that make sense? Okay, so moving on. We're going to use a mass balance and energy balance to solve this problem. Let me see if this other marker will work better. So let's begin with the mass balance. And here it is, the mass in state two less the mass in state one, which this is just the account balance change, is equal to the mass that, let's write it this way, the mass that enters less the mass that exits. Okay, so uh, mass coming in would be a deposit, mass exiting would be, would be a withdrawal, therefore we've got this sign here. You know, we want the final state minus the initial state. So notice the amount of mass that comes in is just zero. And so the negative of the mass that exits is equal to the mass in state two less the mass in state one. This should make sense. If you withdraw something from your account, you change your account in the negative way. Your account balance goes down. So M2 is less than M1, and the signs all make sense. So all we can really get from this so far is the mass that exits is equal to the difference between the mass in state one and the mass in state two. Okay. Now, could we get the mass in state one? Well, sure, we could. In fact, since we're talking about the mass balance, let's go ahead and do it. This is air, it's an ideal gas, and so we can just take P1 V over R T1. Notice I didn't write V1 because the volume of states two and one are the same. So 4,000 
kilopascals multiplied by a half cubic meter divided by the gas constant for air is 0.287 kilopascals times cubic meters, in other words, a kilojoule per kilogram per Kelvin. And then the temperature in state one is 20 plus 273. Remember, we're dealing with the ideal gas law, and so we have to plug in temperatures in absolute units. So let's see what goes away. Well, we're left with kilograms. So the mass in state one, let me just jot it down over here so I can reclaim the board space in a moment. The mass in state one comes out to 23.78 kilograms. Now, if we knew the temperature in state two, we could calculate the mass in state two, but we don't know that. However, we could write something similar. We could say that the mass in state two is P2V over R over T2. And notice, we plug in numbers here. We plug in, let's see what, let me do this over here. M2 equals, we'll plug in P2V over R over T2. So P2 is 2,000 kilopascals. V2 is a half cubic meter, or just the volume. The gas constant is still the same, kilopascals cubic meters per kilogram per Kelvin. So again, all that goes away. But notice we don't know the temperature in state two. However, what this does is allow us to simplify uh, the, the numbers, at least. We put them all together in our calculator and say there's 3884 kilogram Kelvin per T2 in Kelvin. Now, why would I do this? Well, what this does is it gives me a relationship between the mass in state two and the temperature in state two. Okay? That's going to be useful a little bit later. So while I was using the ideal gas law, well, I thought I'd go ahead and just write that one down. Okay, so we really haven't done much. I mean, we found the mass in state one. We've written the mass in state two as a function of the temperature in state two to get the amount of mass that exits, but that's about it. So far, all we've done is use the mass balance. But when I first began the discussion about what was going on in the tank, I was talking about how the air that leaves acquires energy from the air that remains behind. And so that's an energy discussion. So we also need to consider an energy balance in order to solve this problem. So let's go for the energy balance next. Energy in minus energy out equals the change in energy of the system. Now, obviously, no energy flows in. We're assuming that this is adiabatic. I think I may have even said that. Yeah, it says it's insulated. And so Q equals zero. Of course, there's no work interactions here. So there's no way that energy can flow out. And in fact, the only way that energy can leave is with the enthalpy of the leaving stream. There's a mass that leaves or exits, and it carries enthalpy with it. Remember, it has internal energy and flow energy. Those two together are enthalpy. So that quantifies this term a little bit more. And then to calculate the change in energy of the system, well, whatever the mass is in state two times the internal energy in state two, less the mass in state one times the internal energy in state one, well, that's the change in the account balance, right? There's less mass. And each mass has less energy now than it did before. At least that's what we expect. Now notice I have used enthalpy on the left-hand side and internal energy on the right-hand side. Why? What's the difference? Well, the change in the energy of the system, what kind of energy can the system hold? Can it hold kinetic energy or potential energy? No, not as far as we're concerned. Mainly it holds internal energy. Can it hold enthalpy? No. It's not flowing, so it can't have flow energy. The only difference between internal energy and enthalpy is flow energy. This one has it, this one doesn't. Okay, so we can't represent the air in here as if it has enthalpy. Now, you might be able to go look up the enthalpy of air at a certain temperature, but if that air is not flowing, it doesn't have that much energy. It's that simple. So, anyway, this quantifies the change in energy of the system. Notice we've got mass appearing all over the place, so this mass balance is handy because it gives us another equation. And uh, now you might realize, well, wait a second, we've got a problem. Because as the air temperature changes, the amount of energy carried out by the, the mass that's leaving is going to change. It's going to go down. 
At least that's what we expect. We expect the temperature in state two to be less, and it's going to decrease over time. So this enthalpy of the acid extreme is not just one number, and that's a potential problem. How do we deal with that? Do we have to integrate over the whole process? Well, we're not going to do that. You could, but we're not going to. What we're going to do instead is simplify this. We're going to assume that the temperature of the exiting stream is just the average temperature between states one and states two. Now, this is a big assumption. Okay? This means that we're adding in something that's going to make our solution inaccurate. Is it reasonable? Well, sure. The exiting temperature is always between these two. Now, notice I don't know the temperature in state two yet, so I don't know the exiting temperature, but this is helping me get at this enthalpy of the exiting stream. So we're just going to take it to be some average. Okay, now, let's see. So, also making the uh, change here to say, well, I tell you what, let's, let's do this, uh, yeah, let's, let's just do it this way. Uh, the mass that X is, is just M1 less M2 from the mass balance. So we've used up the mass balance, okay, just by plugging it in here. That way we don't have to talk about how much mass X is. And let's not forget the enthalpy of that exiting stream. Uh, on the right hand side, though, uh, let's actually let's just rewrite it for this one. Now I need some way of quantifying the amount of enthalpy and internal energy in the air. Now there is a table in your book we could go to and look up, for example, the internal energy. Uh, initially, but instead of doing that, what I'm going to do is use something we've used once or so before. I'm going to assume something like this. Remember, changes in enthalpy can be written as Cp delta T. And so if I expand this out, it would be enthalpy minus the enthalpy of some reference state equals Cp times the temperature less the temperature at that same reference state. Now what if I take the reference state to be a temperature of absolute zero so that this temperature is now in Kelvin, not Celsius? Well, at a temperature of zero, you could see that the energy would be zero. We can make the same argument for the um, internal energy. That would be Cv delta T. Do the same thing. We'd have H minus, or I'm sorry, internal energy U minus U reference equals CV T less T ref. And of course, if we plug in temperatures of zero, we would expect the reference enthalpy and the reference internal energy to be zero. So what I can do with this is to simply substitute. Anywhere I have enthalpy, I will substitute CPT for U CPT and for U CPT like this. So minus M1 less M2, Cp, and I'm sorry, I said Cp, I meant Cv for the use. So Cp, temperature of X in extreme, equals M2, U2 would be Cv, T2 minus M1, Cv, T1. Okay? So what that does for me is it rearranges the or substitutes into the energy balance so that I can write everything in terms of temperatures instead of energies. So now, let's make a substitution of the exiting temperature, so minus M1 plus M2, Cp, quantity T1 plus T2 over 2 equals M2, and let's factor out the Cv on the right hand side. V times M2 T2 less M1 T2. Okay, now let's see how many unknowns we have in this equation. Well, we don't know the mass in state 2, one unknown. We don't know the temperature in state 2. That's another unknown. But remember when we were dealing with the ideal gas law for state 2, we have a relationship between M2 and T2. So basically we have two equations, two unknowns. All we have to do is solve them. Okay, since what we wanted to find was the temperature in state 2, that's the way we'll go. So let me erase this bit up here. 
and I'll come back up so I've got plenty of room to work. So the first thing I'm going to do is move all these terms to the other side. So 0 equals, just moving this term to the other side, m1 less m2 cp times t1 plus t2 over 2 plus cv for this term m2 t2 less m1 t1. Okay? So, m1 we already know. I'm going to plug in numbers here and I'll explain why in a moment. m1 is 23.78 less and m2 I'm going to write in terms of the equation I've got. Now I've got consistent units so I don't have to carry them through because I run the risk of making a mistake. Go for it. So 3884 over T2 would be the mass in state 2. The heat capacity of air is 1.005. Now, it is in kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin. You see we're dealing with kilograms, Kelvin everywhere. So that should work out. Plus CV, which for air, uh, oh, I forgot T1, T2. So let's see, T1 is 293 plus T2 over 2. Now, why did I use absolute temperature units here? Well, if you plug in relative temperature units, you would still get the average temperature. But be very careful. I've used the idea of gas law, meaning T2 has to be in absolute units. If T2 in this equation ends up being in absolute units, T1 will also have to be in absolute units. And so I have to plug in T1 in absolute units to keep everything consistent. So then um, I'm running out of space, so let me move to the next line. So plus the next term, uh, CV for air is 0.718, again, kilojoules per kilogram per Kelvin, so that works out. The mass in state 2 is 3884 over T2, so there's the mass in state 2 multiplied by T2, okay, coming from there, minus M1, M1 is just 23.78 kilograms times T1. Notice something nice happens here. T2 goes away uh, and cancels from this term. So now we have T2 here, we have T2 here. So what next? Uh, well, next I went through and I solved this using the quadratic equation. Um, I'm not sure how much value that would be for you. Well. This is probably complicated enough that it's worth it. Okay, so let's just continue. All right, so zero equals, uh, let's see, what I did is I took the, gotta figure out exactly, what, oh, I, I know what I did. I took the uh, 1.005 over two and distributed through this. So I ended up with about half of each of these terms, 11.94945 less Half of that or so is 1750.71 over T2. Has to be multiplied by 293 plus T2. Then um, for the next term, let's see, let me figure out what I did here quickly. Oh, I know what I did. The, the next term is all just numbers except for T1. Well, T1 is a number, that's where it is. Okay, so T1, 20 degrees Celsius, if I add 273 to that, then that's what, 293 Kelvin? So T1, I can get rid of that. I can just plug in 293 Kelvin. And now, notice that this whole thing here is just a number, right? It's 0.718 times the difference between 3884 and 23.78 times 293. So that ends up just being a number. So this whole mess here is just a complicated way of writing minus 2501.18. Okay. So now you can see we've got a, we've got a quadratic equation here. Let me uh, expand things just a bit. What I did next was FOIL, so I multiplied this term by this term. So 11 times 293 or so. I got 3501.19. Pretty sure that's how I... That's the only place I could have gotten that from. And then to get uh, uh, 293 times 
1750.71, I got negative 512.958. So this, this is about a million, about a half a million over T2. Okay, that's just the product there, minus, and that takes care of the first term. So then multiply the next term, plus 11.94945 T2. And then when you multiply these two together, of course the T2 cancels. So you just get minus 1750.71, and then finally pulling down the last term, uh, minus 2501.18. Okay, so those are just, notice there's one, two, three constants that go together. I pulled all three of those constants together and got negative 750.7 minus 512.958 over T2 plus 11.94945 T2. And you should recognize this as a quadratic equation now. Notice what we would do is multiply through by T2. We cancel here and you get T2 squared here. Okay. Putting it into standard form, you would recognize that uh, A, for the quadratic equation, let me move back up here, I guess. To use the quadratic equation, A would be equal to the constant. So no, that's not right. I'm not thinking right. A would be the multiplier on the squared term, 9, 4, 9, 4, 5, B would be equal to the coefficient for the first order term, negative 750.7, and C would just be the constant term, negative 5, 12, 9, 5, 8. Okay? And of course the quadratic formula would say that T2 then is equal to negative B plus or minus, I used to write this in lowercase, B squared minus 4AC over 2A. Okay, I won't, for the sake of time in the video, I won't plug all of this in, but uh, of course A goes in here and here, B here, there, and C here. And what you'll notice is since A is positive and C is negative, there's no way we can get a negative square root um, because we'll end up with a positive term there. But anyway, you end up with a temperature of 31.41 plus or minus 209.5. Uh, six. It's pretty obvious you can't choose minus, right? Because you'd end up with a temperature in Kelvin that's below zero. That's not possible. So we'll choose the positive. And so the temperature in state two comes out to 241 Kelvin, which is pretty cold. In 273 degrees is the freezing point of water, and the air in this tank is well below the freezing point. We would expect ice to be forming probably on the outside of this tank. I know there's no heat transfer, but if this is a scuba tank, they're not well insulated. Um, and so we expect for the uh, air around to, well, well, the water to start condensing and, of course, probably freezing on the outside of this thing. Of course, that would affect our, our analysis. But anyway, there's the approximate temperature, the approximate final temperature in state two. You can go back and check and make sure all the equations work out, but that should be a 